I'm going to uh, walk you through um, this next presentation, full confession. Um, this presentation was put together by Cassie Wagner. She works for the Corps of Engineers. Uh, she is out of the Dam Safety Production Center in Sacramento. Um, so just wanted to give Cassie props. Um, I cannot take credit for the content of this uh, presentation. So we're going to talk about, it's kind of the first installment of what we call a desk study. Um, and we're going to talk about that initial data collection and recon. And we will make this be our buddy. There we go. All right. So some quick learning objectives, uh, learn basic process for data collection, identify regional and site specific data sources, learn how to start synthesizing the information for your SQRA. So we're gonna focus on that initial, um, you know, using existing data and then where you might search for missing data. And then the quick outline of what we're gonna walk through. So let's talk about establishing a data collection in your baseline. Um, so, we're, we talk a lot, and you'll have a reading assignment tonight from Carl Terzaghi. He's one of the godfathers of soil mechanics. Um, and so you're going to read um, this document uh, tonight. It's a, it's a snapshot um, about his method of working. Um, so when you conduct an existing information review, start in the big picture, and then you start to narrow your focus as you learn more. Um, and and you, what we want to do for our risk assessments is leverage um, publicly available data, both data from the organization that you're working for um, or um, out there that's publicly available on the internet. So we'll walk through a little bit of that today. Um, you wanna understand your geologic setting and you wanna understand your geomorphic considerations. These are all very important. Um, and you also, that segues into geologic hazards. So the whole time that you're doing this, you wanna start building, what I like to do is I try to build a 3D model of the site in my head and I assemble information as I go. Sometimes we have to put that into a model, and that's, that's but it starts in, in the brain, in my opinion. And you look at for the breadcrumb trails, you'll hear that a lot. So you wanna use site-specific data to review investigations, look at instrumentation and performance. We'll have a talk about that later uh, in the week. Um, and also looking at construction records and project history. So let's look at your basic, uh, where to begin in your, um, baseline data review. So we call this the desktop study. So this is what you can do sitting in your office. It's fun to get out in the field. That's where I'd rather be personally, but it starts in doing your record search. Um, so you want to take this first critical step. It emphasizes the importance of looking at that big picture and then kind of focusing down on more of the site specific details. You wanna understand your regional drivers. If I'm sitting in a, a low seismicity portion of the country, I should understand the seismic loading, but I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Conversely, if I'm in a high seismic area, I'm gonna spend more time looking at that. So you wanna understand tectonic setting, your climate, your stratigraphy, structures, and what impacts the site's, ge what is the geomorphology at the site? Um, so this is what facilitates the process, looking at that broad regional setting and history, deformations, things of that sort before you narrow that focus down. Um, from there, the geologist may consider things like deposit, how the depositional environment informs the material properties, spatial um, geometry, some of the things we talked about in our mock SQRA uh, this morning, and how do those factors influence perspective geologic hazards at the site. In other words, the site-specific uh, conditions evaluated during this initial phase, your desktop study, help inform what kind of geologic vulnerabilities I have, um, as well as what type of evidence and indicators the geologist will look for while reviewing the available information. Um, you always want to have a geologist on your team, but these, this isn't to say that you as an engineer um, can't look at this information as well. Just team up with your geology buddy if you have any questions. So let's talk about understanding uh, the geologic setting. So there's many ways to understand it. These are some just some typical maps. So you can see this is a kind of a larger scale geologic map here. Um, this is looking more at what are the tectonic influences of, of a particular region. Um, and then this one's actually taking even, this is even a further step back. So different scales. So scaling is important when you're looking at this information. And then geomorphology, Justin's gonna talk with us tomorrow about some information, um, geomorphology. Uh, it's not my bailiwick, so I'm not gonna wax philosophic on it, but it's very important. 
Absolutely. Um, this is a process based uh, discipline as geology. Um, so we use process based thinking to understand our site and inform key event tree considerations for failure modes. Um, so you want to look at recent history as well as uh, going back in the way back geologic time machine. Um, so more recent history, depositional environment, geomorphology on active river systems, applying that knowledge to inform continuity when you're looking at an information. Um, we emphasize geomorph because understanding and explaining the depositional environment is very important for estimating properties and continuity. So let's talk a little bit about geomorphic indicators. Geomorphology of alluvial floodplains is particularly vital to water conveyance projects. In this example, we see a USGS topographic map here um, that was used to derive relevant geomorph features. These maps represent pre-dam topography. So a big thing that you'll see when you're working on a risk assessment, whether it be for a levee or a dam, is what did it look like before we built the structure? Um, that's a very important part of, of the process, that, that desktop study. Um, it's critical to our understanding of the potential continuity and thickness of deposits in this location. We can compare this information to any available site data, construction data, as-built information um, to assess post-dam conditions. Um, and a lot of this information, um, and we'll look at a couple different um, websites, is uh, easily available through the USGS. They have quite a cache of uh, geologic maps and, and information. So topographic maps, geologic maps, USDA soil survey maps, aerial photographs, and remote sensing. Um, while historic maps are available in critical websites such as these um, at USGS and USDA, also have spatial files uh, for download. Here are two examples of easily accessible information you can download for your project. We'll go through examples for how to download each. So, um, and these will be in uh, once um, all those uh, uh, presentations are uploaded to the website, you should be able to grab these links and um, I highly encourage you to plug and play. There's a lot of neat information. Even if you don't have a project that you're working on, figure out where your house is or where your residence is and, and, and poke around and see what you're living on top of. Um, so first we'll look at downloading existing USGS geologic maps and other geologic mapping files and reports. This is the map view interface from the USGS. I did check all of these links before the workshop, so they should all still uh, be useful um, and helpful. If you navigate to the uh, web link shown, this will be the initial image you see. So it's a picture of the United States with all of the geologic maps kind of stitched together. And then you can zoom in to particular areas of interest and um, you'll get kind of smaller scale, seven and a half minute quad maps of geology all the way up to statewide maps. Um, so lots of good information available there. Um, so uh, in this example, um, we've zoomed into an area of interest here where you can see the red uh, rectangle. Uh, and this is, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, we're in the general vicinity of Denver. Um, these uh, viewer updates to the files on the um, left-hand side. So you'll see um, as, you, as you kind of click on and bracket an area, all these different related reports and maps that are available will show up on the left-hand side and you can hunt and peck around to find what's helpful. Um, I actually really enjoy doing this. It's my, my heart is in geologic mapping, so this is the fun part for me. Um, so you look, um, we've clicked on in the vicinity of our office in Lakewood, so that's to the west of Denver proper. Um, the surficial layer at this zoom extent is called the Morrison Quadrangle, uh, which was selected when I clicked on the RMC location. I can also browse other available files when I'm ready to download the geologic map, map of this location. I just click the more info. Um, so highly encourage everybody to um, look at the USGS map view and find what you can. If I'm starting a project in an area I've never worked before because I haven't lived everywhere yet, not planning on it, um, this is one of the first places I'll start if I don't have any other um, available information. So there's the more info tab. And then that takes us to, this is um, the Morrison Quad, as I mentioned. So you can see, this is what pops up when you um, click on that more info tab. Um, on the left-hand side, um, the selected quadrangle is shown and you can see the various file sizes available. Um, in this example, there are options to download. Um, so it's not always the case for every file out there. Um, the USGS is working on it, but it's not ready yet. Um, in a pinch, what I have been able to do is you can open this up and you can blow it up um, to grab a screenshot of the information that you're interested in. 
um, and make sure you screenshot any relevant key or, or inf information that would be um, helpful for whatever you're working on. So um, backing up, pointing out here that there are various ways um, to sort the listed files for your location by default, the map view interface will sort by year. I find it helpful to resort to, to resort available files by scale um, because you might be looking for something um, of, of, of a larger scale or maybe a more fine tuned scale um, to look for the most local documentation. Um, encourage um, everyone to spend time with the site. It's actually a lot of fun. Sometimes I just get curious about something that I see on the news and I look in here because I'm kind of a nerd that way. Um, but I have this, uh, Cassie makes the note and I also have this link bookmarked um, in my web browser. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the um, USDA NRCS uh, web soil survey. Um, uh, full uh, admission here, I consider myself a hard rock geologist, but I've also spent probably half my career dealing with alluvial fan deposits in the desert, so I had to learn, I needed to know about soils, um, and they're a little bit different, but there's additional resources, which is a good thing. Um, so um, this is the US uh, DA website, the Web Soil Survey. Um, when you navigate to the link above, then um, you want to select that Start WSS here. And um, note the home screen has a lot of other great tools and information. So this is another good location where you can find a lot of information quickly. Um, and it's kind of fun to hunt and peck around. Um, you know, you might be doing something project specific, but certainly um, encourage getting familiar with the website and all the information that it has to offer. So uh, once you kind of start, you kind of go into this, um, this map view. So you use the magnifying glass that uh, is shown up here, this tiny little icon, um, to set the limits of the area you want to zoom to. And once you have that area um, bracketed, um, then you can uh, click on the area of interest button, oops, sorry, um, to define the area. So again, lots, of just kind of dialing in like the information available. And then here um, you can see that there's information that's popping up. You've got a soil map, uh, you've got your area of interest, you've got a soil map, soil data. Um, you can download that soil data. Um, and then there's also information kind of on this left-hand side. So this is, um, if you click on that soil map, then um, what'll happen is it'll overlay um, the different soil, uh, the mapped soil uh, units. Um, and then you'll see, um, they're listed out here and uh, kind of um, basic information. I believe um, you'll see the various layers starting with the basic soil map and then the soil data explorer tab, which is the next one over here, um, allows you to sort, uh, sort the soils by various properties, including agricultural and engineering. Um, so for a long time, uh, maybe this is just a Susie problem and not a real problem, but um, I had to understand when you do the, the, the agricultural classifications for soils, um, you, you, there's a little work in getting that into the engineering paradigm that I'm more accustomed to. I think this has been improved. Uh, these include permeability, fines content, plasticity, various soil classification systems, both USCS and AASHTO. Um, the, these are, are useful for different tasks um, that you might have. So pretty good information here all readily available, all open source. The information can be downloaded in addition to printing maps and soil data output. So you can, um, you need to do a proper citation, but you can clip an image out of here and drop it into your report. It's a quick way to grab information. A lot of times we don't have a lot of budget, especially at the SQRA level, we're dealing with um, pretty modest budgets compared to when we get into the higher level risk assessments. And you can get, uh, you can also um, grab a custom soil report for the area that was bracketed. Um, so um, lots of interesting information to be pulled out of this particular website. So similar to the USGS one, encourage uh, you play around with it. If you don't have a project in particular, um, you know, see what your house sits on if you're curious. Okay, so um, these are great resources um, as well. Um, to better understand an area's physiography and geomorphology. So this is the actual soil survey. Um, I think this is more of a regional approach versus that site-specific area that you bracketed. So 
again, you want to start out big and kind of work your way into more and more information, kind of circle like a shark, a data shark. I just made that up. Okay. So these are just examples of the information that you can find um, through that USDA website. So a couple more online resources. Um, these should, again, you should be, these are, links are all uh, workable. Um, so we've got the national map, USGS National Geologic Database, we looked at that. Um, US geologic maps um, from US states. So when I was working in New Mexico, um, I had a hotline to our um, local geologic survey. So I talked to those guys frequently when I had challenges and I couldn't find the information online. Oftentimes, I'm just, that's just an aside, um, there's no link to that. Um, but if you're working in a particular state, uh, I highly encourage uh, making contacts with those folks at the State Geologic Survey. They're always happy to help. It's what they do and um, it's, it's good stuff. So, so it's just some other um, places where you might find information as well. And then some more online resources for you. So these are all included in, your, um, in that presentation when it's available. Okay, so we have a little knowledge share. Does anyone have any resources that you use um, that you want, would like to share with the class? Yes, Tom. Yeah, yeah, what you got? If you're looking at the groundwater data, the public health departments have all the private wells, so the huh. water quality data, public wells, drinking water, supply wells. So if you have closed feeder sites, it's more Yep, so I'll repeat that on the mic. Um, so uh, what, what Tom was saying is um, that local and state health departments will actually have information on groundwater wells in the area. If you're not able to find it through these other resources, you might be able to reach out to them. Yep. State oil and gas folk. A lot of great. Uh, yep. Cool yep, absolutely. So state uh, oil and gas. Uh, most states have some sort of regulatory body in the state. Um, some don't, but that might be because you're not actually developing any oil and gas resources, but that's a great point. Additional resources can be had there for sure. Any other resources that you all have used? Yep. Oregon, Dogami's great. Oh yeah, I used to live in Oregon. So that's essentially the state geologic survey, uh, but Dogami in Oregon is a great resource as well. Uh, for sure, so appreciate that. Yep. Yes, Manel. Uh, ah, yes. I when when I moved to Colorado, we were getting ready to buy a house, and we happened to live in a town called Lafayette. It's an old coal mining town. Manel is actually my neighbor. I can throw a rock at her house. Maybe on a maybe on a good day. Maybe I have. That was closer. But anyways, um, there's a fault trend that runs kind of to the northeast from the southwest where you have the towns of Superior, um, Louisville, Lafayette, and Erie, and they're, all the old coal mines are shown on these maps. So before we bought the house, I wanted to see if we had any coal mines under the house, and we do. There's one that just cuts across the corner, and I got a little worried, so I started to dig deeper and dig deeper through the resources that Manel mentioned. Um, and it's a pretty deep coal mine, so I wasn't concerned that my basement was going to, you know, subside into the ground. But as you go north from that area, the um, coal mine, uh, the, the, the rock has a pitch up. And so in Erie to the north and east, they do have subsidence problems because those coal mines get a lot more shallow. So anyways, lots of good information to be out there. Anything else? No? Okay. Thanks for sharing. Okay. So baseline data collection, this is something that I get really excited about. So we've talked a little bit about um, knowing your geologic setting, regional geology and geologic history, site geology and those geomorph processes. Um, but let's talk a little bit about um, available data. Um, so a lot of times on our big core dams, the folks that designed and built these dams created a ton of documentation. We have done a bad job of keeping track of it um, but that's not to say you shouldn't look. There's actually a lot of good information out there. So we want to find um, available in in investigations. We want to find instrumentation and performance data. Centerline profile sections. These are some basic things that you should have as part of your site characterization. Upstream to downstream sections with applicable data, including the free attic surface. Um, project history, construction photos. 
Um, don't be discouraged if someone tells you that that information doesn't exist because I have found it literally in the rafters of the maintenance buildings at our dams. So that data is out there unless somebody threw it out, took it home, which is possible, um, or there was a fire or a flood, which also comes up occasionally. Foundation mapping during construction, that is a huge breadcrumb that you want to try to find if you can, because again, the folks that put these dams and levees, uh, levees are a little bit more challenging, but certainly our big dams have a ton of documentation. Um, and then records from construction. I'm not going to get off, go off on my archives thing just yet, because I think there's a slide for that. So for facility specific documentation, as I mentioned, um, for USACE projects, and I don't think this is uncommon at other places as well, there should be a bevy of design and construction records and previous subsurface investigations that you want to try to track down. Um, we're looking for foundation completion reports, embankment construction reports, as built drawings, facility um, geologic investigations, facility inspections. So one of the great breadcrumb trails that you can find if you're lucky is high water monitoring reports, and these might be prepared for dams or levees. Um, so a lot of interesting information that may not get rolled into uh, an annual inspection report or a five year inspection report. So um, keep asking people where the data is if you can't, if, if they're not able to locate it. Construction photos are huge. So a lot of times in our risk assessments, I was just on a PA in, in, uh, in Texas, uh, periodic assessment, uh, which is uh, the core's 10 year semi quantitative risk assessment for our owned and operated structures. We could not find anything in the um, construction documentation to explain how they um, prepared exposed embankment surfaces because um, they built the dam up in stages. And so we couldn't find it in the, in the construction documentation that was available. We couldn't find it in the specifications. It was kind of lightly touched on, but it wasn't like the, you know, the dead ringer that we were looking for until we found some construction photos. And then you could see like this embankment sat exposed for several years because they had an embankment slide and I won't get into it. It's a fascinating project, um, but they had to redesign the project before they resumed embankment um, construction. And we had concerns there was deep erosion rills on that surface. There was vegetation this high. I mean, weeds grow, so whatever, maybe not a big deal, but there's vegetation established. It wasn't until we went through the mountain of construction photos that we found actual photographic evidence that they were clearing that vegetation off. They were blading the exposed embankment down to remove those erosion rills. Um, and then we were able to piece the remaining preparation of that surface together. So million dollar, uh, millions of dollars uh, worth of pain and suffering in the field if you can find your construction photos. Plus it's kind of fun to see how they built these things anyway, so I'm just kind of a nerd that way. All right, so instrumentation, a subject that's near and dear to my heart. I'll regale you, about with, uh, regale you with some interesting things later in the week. Um, but it's a huge resource, and I will say for all the reports I've reviewed over the years, it seems to be the thing that gets kind of neglected the most. Sometimes old instrumentation is challenging to understand, and we'll talk more about it later in the week. It's a critical resource, though. Um, so you want to make sure that you get your hands on all of the um, historic information for the project from the time that instrument went in until present. You want to see those high pool loadings. Um, you want to see survey information over time. All of this, um, it may not appear to you initially why this is important, but it really is going to be part of the backbone of your risk assessment. So I can't stress that enough. So <laughs> I had to actually, Cassie's on maternity leave, and so this is her story. So it's story time is what she would say. Um, and I wanted to make sure I got this story right because it's such a great story. Um, so what does um, Florida Gator, a cow, and then contaminated groundwater have anything to do with each other? Well, I'll tell you, and I'm going to have to read it verbatim so I don't get it wrong. So a soil science professor at University of Florida tasked with determining where arsenic contamination in drinking wells is coming from, he was hired by farmers, pulled water well data from the area, made potentiometric maps. None of the anticipated flow patterns matched the contamination pattern. So it wasn't, it wasn't adding up in a traditional assessment. Did not make any sense. Um, comparing the model of the site data, I'm sorry, comparing the model of the site to the data did not match up. So they talked to a sage old professor. Um, so, so they talked to 
um, a sage old professor who said, suggested talking to the, to the rogue, ROG, or the resident old guy, or it could be resident old gal. I'm, I'm good with that too. AKA the resident old person. <laughs> professor took the advice and found someone who lived there for 70 years and uh, going generations back. They said to get ticks off the cattle, they would plug sinkholes, this is terrible, um, filled with arsenic water, terrible, and run the cattle through the ponds. This is actually probably not an uncommon practice today. They just don't think they use arsenic anymore. Um, then to unplug the sinkholes, and they would unplug the sinkholes and let the, let the water soak into the ground. The professor would never have thought of this. This would never have occurred to him or her um, had he not spoken to the resident old dude. Um, once he figured this part out, they could design a way to clean up the groundwater. So you heard us joking a little bit about it this morning in our mock SQRA. Um, so I wasn't quite playing the resident old dude um, when I put the local interest hat on, but that's why you wanna talk to the, the oldest maintenance worker at the dam. You wanna, whenever I go out on a site visit, I take time, I talk to the engineers and stuff, that's cool, but I wanna talk to the folks that have been at that project, looking after it year in, year out to find out. But the first question I ask is, what are you worried about out here? So talk to those people, they're a huge resource. They may not have an engineering degree or a science degree, um, but their understanding of the area and, the, and, the, and that particular structure um, is invaluable. And if you don't ask those questions and find those people, you might be missing something really important or just spend too much money trying to clean up something that you don't understand. Okay, so condensing and focusing geologic info. Um, so we'll go more into more detail about this in a later presentation but communication of critical subsurface information in the context of dam and levee safety is huge. So our most effective communication strategy is to condense and focus geologic information. So remember I said we did a long, like maybe year and a half, two year field study out at uh, Blakely Mountain Dam, and I had to try to condense all of that into a few slides for senior leadership to help make a decision. Um, so this is where the fun of site characterization really comes in. So searching for files, um, one of my favorite things. Um, so uh, most of the documentation, as I mentioned, was produced during construction and it no longer resides um, at the home office. So in the Corps of Engineers, we have requirements to transfer um, files, civil works files, which is what our dams and levees fall under, to the National Archives and Records Holding. Um, so oftentimes we don't have all the documentation in house and we have to dig a little deeper. Um, so commonly missing documentation as I kind of alluded to, construction photos and reports, complete as built. We can find 10 copies of the same construction drawings and I don't care about, I mean the changes in design are interesting, but what I care about is what was stamped as built, what was actually put into service. And it's not as easy to find them as you'd like. Um, historic instrumentation data. Uh, full complement of design reports, specification, high water inspection reports. Um, this is a picture of a foundation map. Todd probably recognizes this a little bit from John Martin Dam, which is on the Arkansas River in southeastern Colorado. Um, the team was about to embark on a very costly field investigation, and I happened to be listening to a vertical team briefing, and they said they didn't have any information on the construction of the concrete dam, and I threw my hand up on the WebEx and actually came off of mute because this was one of my old dams in Albuquerque. Um, and I said, I know for a fact those maps exist in National Archives because I saw them when I was there looking for documents on another project and I made some notes about it. So we were able to go back in, Manel helped out with this um, at the time as well and we were able to um, grab all of the historic, this is the mapped um, uh, monolith for that particular, one of the monoliths of that structure. So a lot of good information, you just gotta keep digging for it. So uh, searching for files. Um, as I've mentioned, most documentation is boxed up and moved to records holding. It, is, it eventually gets permanently archived, permanently accessioned is what they call it at the National Archives. If anybody has any questions, I've been in the archives so much they know me when I come in, they're like, oh, you again, great. Um, so, um, We've got these specific regulations that mandate the, the permanent storage of these. They are not to be destroyed. There's a lot of documents that the Corps of Engineers generates that 
don't get archived. But this stuff is this stuff is supposed to. Um, some records may be lost to um, flood, fire, or accident, but most files are not lost. So a joke um, during the ABQ periodic assessment assessment was this is my old office in Albuquerque district. Um, Amy's going to talk about this later in the week, so I won't steal her thunder, but I will mention that we did a lot of phases of remedial grouting at the project. And I was just rooting around in my own office because I had done a rockfall analysis years prior, and I found a 1960-something, say 66, grouting report, and it unzipped an enormous amount of terrifying information that I won't tell you about now because I don't want to scare, I don't want to steal Amy's thunder, um, but had I not found that in my own office, um, I think the outcome of that initial risk assessment would have been quite different. So this is a short list. Um, these are at um, core district offices. So if you're internal to the core, these are some places you can look. If you're external to the core and you're helping us with a risk assessment, ask these questions of your district POCs um, because you literally will find information everywhere. Um, Obviously, in dam or levee safety files that are arch archived typically in the geotechnical um, branch, uh, construction may have documentation, public affairs. I found a box of construction photos for Santa Rosa Dam randomly sitting in public affairs. I just happened to be talking to a public affairs person. I said, I just found some stuff for Santa Rosa. Do you want it? And I was like, yeah. Um, so you can find it in many places, emergency management. Um, civil files, so in structural, general, civil, mechanical, electrical planning has documentation. Environmental, believe it or not, they actually get involved. So if we need to do any kind of remediation work at these dams, we have to get a categorical exclusion as part of uh, that process. And so your, your local um, archaeologist or environmental engineer might have some information because they had to do work at the project. Um, also, as a side note, email the levy sponsors, so a lot of the risk assessments that the Corps is pushing forward on now, they aren't our structures. Uh, we may have designed and built them uh, historically, but then we turn them over to a local sponsor. Um, so that local sponsor may have documentation that the Corps does not. Um, and then, yeah, email entire, <laughs> I did this one time, we were getting ready to do a risk assessment, and I just shotgun blasted the whole office, which is a big no-no. Looking for files, but I got more information. So. It's either in my office or someplace else. Okay, so uh, other places to search while you're at the project office um, and other locations, visitor center. They might have something in the park ranger's office. Powerhouse, um, at Abiquiu Dam, we have a FERC um, regulated structure at the toe of the dam and we would work with them often uh, to share information, um, which was a good thing. So they may have some information. There might be something stashed in the intake tower that you're looking for. The O&M manual might be mothballed up in the corner because one of the guys put it up there at one point. Rafters of the maintenance buildings, true story. I've stood on, I've done that thing where I was trying to get a Darwin Award where I'm standing on a table on top of a chair to try to get to something. Uh, the boathouse and talk to the maintenance crews and the rangers again they're out there every day um, and then if it's it's for a levy you want to talk to the, the city uh, maintenance folks the, the folks that are responsible for putting those um, flood closures in and and so on and so forth everybody's got a little bit of information up in here or they know where something might be so searching for files who is the records manager this is more of an internal core thing, but I think it would benefit others um, external to the core that are going to be helping us out with this stuff. So ask who the records manager is in your district office. Um, there is a human that is assigned to do this. This is what they do. Um, they should, if they do their jobs properly, should have um, lists um, of all of the information that was boxed up and shipped, shipped to records holding, which is then eventually put into um, the permanent archives. Um, so we found information sitting in the archives, but then there was a pile of information on a particular project sitting in records holding. And then there was even more information sitting in the pre-records holding stash in a storage unit. Um, so become friends with your records manager. If they're good at what they do, they'll find you a lot of information. So um, National Archives, they have hubs across the country. Um, you can go to this website and try to find your closest uh, ar archive servicing center. Um, they're very friendly. They're basically like super nerdy librarians, even if that's hard to imagine, like a librarian being nerdier, but this is like the top tier of librarians here. Um, and they love a good search. So reach out to them. You can send them an email. 
Um, they're more than happy to work with you. Um, they can quickly find um, where Army Corps of Engineers files are and they can start turning you on to something called a record locator. Um, I think that's coming up in the subsequent slide. So hunt and peck around. There's the National Archives main hub is in Washington, D.C. if you want to see the Declaration of the Independence. Um, so there's nothing that fancy um, in the regional centers, but there's a lot of good information that you may not find otherwise. So just a little more information here. Um, also just random factoid, if you're into genealogy, a lot of the research rooms have free um, genealogy research, research access. So I live down the street from ours in Broomfield, Colorado. It's about a five minute drive. And like I said, they know me there. I enjoy going. So search the catalog and then this will bring you um, into a place where you could say like for this example, what Cassie typed in was Navajo Dam, which is a reclamation structure. Um, so she was able to do that. And then bingo, bango, bongo, she's got a whole list of tidbits of information on um, Navajo Dam. Um, so there's a, it's, and it's gotten better over time. When I first started going, I'd get a PDF of like a, a, a records uh, list about that thick and half the stuff in there was for military bases. And then also a big chunk of it was like, not kidding, timesheets from people in the 50s. Yep, we, we archived that too, evidently. Um, so it takes a lot of tenacity to dig once you get in here, but it's very rewarding if you have the time uh, to do so. So list, um, the, you know, you get contact info. They will send you links to the finding aids is what they're called. Um, and this is a clip for uh, John Martin Dam. Uh, we were looking, as I mentioned, for that foundation mapping. Okay, thank you. I said I was going to finish early and I just ramble on anyways. Um, so pretty easy to use these days. Don't be shy about reaching out to them if you can. Um, when you visit the archives, some things to think about um, is bring your laptop. It used to be that we thought, man, wouldn't it be great if we could like scan everything in at like a bazillion DPI and that proved to be incredibly difficult. Um, so we opted for smartphones. So um, you can do a lot with your smartphones these days, bring your laptop. Um, I also encourage creating a list like you see here and, and letting them know, hey, I'm going to be in next week. Um, I'd like to meet with you and look for these files. And then they can kind of start getting prepared. But it is open access to the public. And what you'll need to do is apply for a researcher's card, which is good for two years. I'm sorry, good for one year. Um, and uh, you'll pretty much gain access to whatever whatever you ask for at that point. So good question. Yep. Does the Army Corps continue to do the project-wise uh, older structures? I was involved in helping scan, so I've been there, the archives and so on, and site, and you all know, gave us a older structure that we had to scan drawings. Sounds like you worked on some project data books. Thank you for your support, because I know that those are challenging. So yeah, so so once we're able, that's, enough, that's a great question. So once we're able to find these documents, we want to keep copies of them so the next generation doesn't have to root around so much. So yeah, so then eventually it gets pulled over to our um, permanent storage and project-wise for the electronic version. So yeah, we're, we're still doing that. Yep. Uh-huh. These ever get fully digitized, so you have a you have a storage container like we were talking about records. Does, do, they, do they get scanned and put in, or they just sit there? They are literally. It's it's a pretty nifty facility in Broomfield, so it's climate controlled, state of the art, all that jazz. But no, they are not um, being scanned. We can request to them to scan documents, but what we've learned is. They're really, they don't have the staff, first of all. So it's a massive facility and there's probably six people running around the, you know, the archivist. Um, so they can do some um, photocopies or scanning, but when you start to get into the mountains of data that we're typically looking for, they don't have the personnel and so they ask that we come in. So no, not, not as a matter of course, yeah. So for projects where you have a lot of paper copies, mm -hmm. What's the best way to, to get the whole team to be able to review those if the whole team can come and look at the room full of them? Sure, sure. So for sure, um, and that's kind of the point that I made about when you go to the archives, be prepared to collect an electronic copy. Um, so I've gone in there on my own looking for very specific information. And then um, as Amy can attest to, um, I've gone in there with three other people. 
and we've literally divided and conquered. So I don't want to leave the, or if I find something good that I think is going to be useful for the team, I try to get, um, scan copy is a little more challenging, um, especially for the larger format drawings. Um, so that's an ongoing challenge we have, but in a pinch, um, I've stood on top of a table or on a wobbly chair trying to get that as-built drawing. Because um, again, our smartphones have come a long way. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's a challenge. We want to make sure what we're seeing in the archives, we get an electronic copy so that we can bring back, that back to the team. Because I don't want them to count on my opinion. I want them to see it for themselves. Yep, good question. Yes, Minnell. Um, I completely agree with that. Uh, what level of risk assessment we would go to this step? Yes. For the other sources too. Sure. Sure. So I think some of the earlier, that's a great question. Um, so, so for the earlier sources where you're, it's easily accessible via the internet, um, it's always going to be based on time and budget that's available, of course. Um, but I think those um, resources I looked, walked you through earlier are completely okay to use for an SQRA level to help build your site model or site characterization. When you start getting into archive searches, that tends to be more of a quantitative risk assessment task. So typically at the SQRA level, we're not gonna have the budget to send teams of people into the archives to fish all this documentation out. And it has to be, thank you. And it has to really be, am I supporting risk driving failure mode? Am I finding information that's gonna help reduce that uncertainty and, 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 and make, a, make a change in the risk understanding as well? So does that answer that? Yeah. So for PAs, our, our 10 year uh, SQRAs and our SQRAs, um, I would say unlikely that you will get into archives. You're gonna need to leverage existing data in the district where I had that long list of all the places you could find. So sorry, I teased you a little bit with some QRA um, information. Um, so if you get budget to do it, make sure you're doing it in a very definitive way. Um, and you have to you know, justify the expense, but typically it's at a higher level risk assessment that we start going into data dives at the archives. Okay. So data collection, we wanna clearly define our objectives, how much data is required for the scope, which was kind of what we just talked about. Who is aggregating the data? Um, and you wanna identify all the team members. Typically you're gonna have more than one person helping out with this. Um, and then what format should that data be prepared? Um, I would say, uh, in the words of my old graduate advisor, whatever it takes to tell the story. So if it makes more sense to put the data in a table, put it in a table. If it makes more sense to overlay information on a map or a section, do that too. Um, use your judgment. Um, consider the nature of the project, the sense of urgency, and what kind of available resources you have. So dams versus levees in terms of data availability, I touched on this a little bit, but it is typically on our big dams for the core, we have a bevy of information. Um, so this is just showing across the scale, the information we have over about 500 feet along the profile. And then for levees, it can be 5,000 feet. Um, so there's a scaling issues between dams and levees, and there's a data issue between them. Oftentimes we have little or no information on our levees. Uh, which can be a bit of a challenge. Um, so limited documentation on levees, um, that construction, um, it depends on the levy. So there's some levees that the Corps um, designed and built and then turned over to the local sponsors. There's a lot of other levees that local sponsors built. Um, so there could be a lot of um, work that has been done that wasn't documented as well as the core had um, for theirs. Not a criticism, just a fact. Um, a lot of times these small levy um, like levied places don't have a lot of money to do this kind of work. Um, so in some cases where subsurface investigations happen prior to other to raises, others where there's none. Um, so there tends to be more uncertainty on our levy projects. Records were destroyed, that's not an uncommon place, or stored in multiple places. So there's that tenacity component. Um, and then just the, you gotta go so many miles, you're gonna be um, trying to interpret between, you know, a couple thousand uh, feet of, um, of boring data. So that's when your understanding of your geomorph and other considerations can help you uh, better understand things. Um, so generally speaking, we don't have mapping, um, geologic or foundation mapping for those. Um, so real quick, uh, 
What we use a lot of basic stuff. So I mentioned I'm a fan of PowerPoint. I can do a lot in PowerPoint because I'm not an ArcGIS person. Um, we use a lot of Excel. There's um, publisher, drawing software, ArcGIS, AutoCAD. So just a question for the group, and I'm out of time. Real quick, what kind of what kind of software do you guys use for your site characterization? I started using OneNote. Uh huh. Yeah. Yep. In SQRA. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I like OneNote for sure. Make sure you have a good internet connection. It gets a little clunky. How? Anyone else? Helpful or useful software you use? Rockworks. Yep. That's a good one. Google Earth. I love Google Earth. <laughs> for sure. Microstation, yes, we have to. <laughs> Good to get accustomed to it. Anything else? So these are our key takeaways. You guys have any questions or any thoughts? Okay. Thank you.